I want to start with the relationship between the book and the podcast from which it emerged. For some listeners, uh, this book may seem like it comes out of nowhere. All of a sudden, Rachel Maddow's writing about uh, the history of fascism in America in the <laughs> 30s and early 40s and has done serious deep dives in criminal cases that had been long forgotten. But uh, this is actually part two of a project. So walk us back to uh, the Ultra Project and how you got interested in this subject. So I was really interested in something that was coming up in contemporary politics, which is the moment that we're having in terms of the right and what you might characterize as the ultra-right in terms of the Trumpist movement within the Republican Party. And at the same time, we were seeing what we used to call the alt-right. I don't know if we're supposed to call them anymore, but essentially neo-Nazi, very anti-Semitic, very edgy, violent, anti-democratic um, movements outside electoral politics and seeing those things coming up together. And I was not curious, but sort of worried about what was going on in electoral politics and also seeing that rise in anti-Semitism, neo-Nazi stuff, and Holocaust denial. And Holocaust denial is, among all the terrible things it is, one of the things that I've always thought about it is that it's just strange. It's a, it's a strange set of beliefs, given all the documentation there is of the Holocaust. Um, and so I started looking at what are the American origins of that? What's the sort of American prehistory of Holocaust denial? What other sorts of political movements have been alive in the country at a time when Holocaust denial has been ascendant? And I ended up getting as far back as like 1948 in terms of the earliest instances that I could find of American Holocaust denial, which is very strange, right? 1948, there are a lot of people who can personally testify to the events of the Holocaust. How can it possibly be that people are saying it didn't happen? Well, it was part of a larger political project. They didn't earnestly believe that the Holocaust didn't happen. They were propounding that for a different reason. And, and once I got into that weird history, I stumbled into the Great Sedition Trial of 1944 and all of these Americans who sided with the Germans in World War II, who in some cases worked for Germany, and then this German agent who was running a plot with two dozen members of Congress, the failed court cases around a number of those um, those plots and instances, and I didn't expect to stumble on all that, um, became fascinated with it and decided to tell that story. So, so the Ultra podcast really focuses, um, as you know, on, on, on two trials, on the Sedition Trial 1940 against the Christian Front, which was a ultra-right paramilitary group, and then the Great Sedition Trial in 1944, which was nearly 30 defendants all in the same courtroom all at once. Both of those prosecutions failed. That was sort of the story of ultra, but I wanted to tell the story of those movements and how influential and powerful they were in American politics more broadly with more characters, and, and that's what I did in the book. Yeah, so... One thing that is super interesting about the book, and it you you tease it in in the podcast as well, is how comparatively small a role the criminal justice process plays in the defeat of these movements relative to a kind of whole of society response to them. You spend a lot of time in the book talking about the Washington Post, talking about, and a particular reporter uh, there, you spend a lot of time talking about a guy who does direct mail advertising <laughs> and has a newsletter about it who discovers this pattern of propaganda mailings and kind of unravels it. And you know, I'm I'm interested in this because once again, the the title of the book is prequel, and the reason for our interest in this subject now, of course, is that it has something to do with our contemporary reality. Um, but once again, we are all getting deeply wrapped up in the criminal process as our salvation here. We have we did it with Mueller. We did it with 
you know, the, the pre Mueller Russia investigation. And now we have indictments and it's all very exciting. And God knows I'm spending all my time covering these cases. And yet part of me looks at your book and says, hey, the moral of the story here is that the criminal process has a role to play in this, but it is not a substitute for the societal reckoning that in this case happened because we had World War II. Mm-hmm. And right, that that what really defeated the America First Committee was Pearl Harbor. And so I'm I'm interested in before we get into the details you know the bob muller figure jack smith figure of that time is your your great character o john raji who's yeah. a genuine hero and a tremendous failure um in every <laughs> real like he was good enough to bring down the Huey Newton, uh, Huey Newton, sorry, <laughs> the Huey Long organization, um, but not couldn't couldn't take on successfully domestic Nazis. Are we over investing in the criminal process? It's a. I'm so glad that you focused in on that because I think it's definitely one of the key revelations that I experienced personally in working on this. And I feel like it's one of the most resonant things in terms of how it makes me think about today's news. I mean, to cut to the chase, I mean, I think the bottom line is that the criminal justice system and the criminal legal process is necessary, but not sufficient. I do think it's important that when there are crimes, they are prosecuted as crimes. And one of the hallmarks of a democracy that's in danger Um, is that you've got violence encroaching on what should be the political space. Violence is always a crime, and you should treat it as a crime. And the criminal justice system can't absent itself from prosecuting acts of violence or intimidation or threats just because those things are motivated by some larger political project. I, I really believe that is true. And I equally believe that the criminal justice system cannot do any of this on its own. And so... You know, looking back at this era that um, I covered in in prequel and also in in the podcast Ultra, there's there's, for example, the story of the German American Bund, and um, most of what I'm interested in the book is is native grown, not German American diaspora fascism, but the Bund was German American diaspora fascism. They were linked to the Nazi Party in Germany. They were engaged in some arguably seditious stuff. They were engaged in violent plots and working with other paramilitary groups. There was all sorts of problems in terms of what the Bund was doing. They were also doing just all this deeply creepy stuff like running Hitler youth summer camps all over America. But ultimately, the head of the German-American Bund got arrested and prosecuted and deported back to Germany for embezzling from that organization. Now, was the biggest problem in the German-American Bund that they had Fritz Kuhn embezzling from their fund? No. And did his arrest and prosecution and deportation under those terms define the end of that organization or the the ultimate confrontation with what that organization was doing? No. It was essentially, it was a a sort of sideshow in terms of the accountability and the opposition that they faced. Similarly with the Christian Front, similarly with the sedition trial defendants in 1944. What Raggi did as prosecutor was fail, basically, in the courtroom. But the larger story of what he did is that those investigations and those prosecutions had the effect of airing out for the public what those organizations were doing, what those members of Congress were involved in, what those congressional staffers were involved in, what those Nazi agents were doing. And it had a benefit. It didn't work in the courtroom. He had a huge fight with the Justice Department as to whether or not to publicize his his uh, findings in a in an official Justice Department report. He was fired um, for arguably breaking Justice Department policy, arguably for political reasons. Um, the criminal justice system is a piece. It's a piece of it, um, but it can't do everything. And journalism, activism. An institution standing up for their own values, uh, institutions, everything from the military to the church to the legal profession, all standing up, all all matters in some cases just as much. Yeah. So let's uh, let's follow that and 
break down this conversation by category of societal organization. It seems to me that the uh, organization that most failed, if you think about it from a sedition investigation point of view, uh, is the FBI. Yep. Uh, uh, and which is at the time, of course, uh, run by J. Edgar Hoover, deeply trusted by President Roosevelt, and is actually asked to look, to look into this stuff. Roosevelt is concerned, and Hoover does very little at first to the point that and I didn't know this until I read the book, that naval intelligence is effectively picks up some of the slack. Uh, give us your impressions of the FBI's failure in this space. It's a really interesting dynamic, and it is more, um, in some ways, more complex and also more small and petty than I expected. Some of what happened in the FBI was very much personality driven and jealousy driven. Um, and it just like catty and petty in a very junior high school sort of way. There was a star agent named Leon Turo who played an important role in breaking up um, a Nazi saboteurs ring, Nazi spies, people are actually sent over from Germany. Um, and that became a big story. It became a big um, newspaper story. It became fodder for Hollywood. And J. Edgar Hoover was very jealous of that and didn't want Leon Turow to be a famous G-man. J. Edgar Hoover wanted himself to be the only famous G-man. He fired Turow over that. Turow ended up moving to Europe and um, having a very interesting end to his career after being probably the most famous figure in the FBI other than Hoover. I think that actually played an interesting role. That had some interesting spillover into how entities like Hollywood ended up portraying the Nazi threat and the sort of fifth column threat and the native fascist threat in this country. So there was some of it like that, which was just interesting human drama. But then there was also the ideological cant of the FBI, which was very much eyes left in terms of the threat. And that was true for federal law enforcement. That was also true for local law enforcement. And so some of the real drama and some of the real heroics that you learn about in this period are from individuals like Leon Lewis, who was running what was in effect a private spying operation for the ADL, for the Anti-Defamation League in Southern California, where he was running a spy group of spies, mostly German-American World War I veterans, who infiltrated pro-Nazi and, and native fascist groups. They produced incredible written documentation of what those groups were up to. They tried to interest local and federal law enforcement in it. The FBI told them they weren't interested. Uh, LAPD, uh, San Diego Sheriff, other local law enforcement told them they weren't interested. Leon Lewis, as you mentioned, was able to get naval intelligence in interested in it, I think in part because he had proven himself to them. A couple of U.S. Marines had been court-martialed, actually, on the basis of Lewis's information about Marines who were stealing U.S. military weapons and providing them to some of these fascist groups. But it was so catch-as-catch-can just because law enforcement didn't want to believe that the threat was from the right. Law enforcement didn't want to believe that the basic... I think, worldview of the fascist groups was either incorrect or dangerous. Uh, the anti-Semitic worldview, the anti-communist worldview, um, and the pro-fascist worldview were widely shared by law enforcement figures at low and high. And the people who were fighting these guys were really up against that in a very overt way. So I think there's actually a, uh, I, I agree with all of that. I think there's another dynamic that is subtly important in the 30s, which is that, you know, the sympathy in law enforcement for right-wing racists, uh, which of course goes back, you know, quite a ways and, you know, has its own Southern origin, um, you know, as a sort of, you know, post-Civil War uh, reaction. Uh, the relationship between the Klan and lots of local PDs, et cetera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
none of this has an overseas lilt until the 30s, right? That, you know, you think about, so if you're J. Edgar Hoover, you think of, first of all, who was in fact himself a vicious racist, um, you have a certain sympathy with the worldview and you don't look at these people, you see these people as sort of local good old, good old boys, not people who are in fact being controlled and operated by a foreign government. Whereas the, your nativism uh, and you know, your sense of overseas threat is super, super consistent with your anti-left bias. And so every local communist is being run by Moscow, but every local fascist is just some good old boy who maybe roughed somebody up or something, rather than you're seeing, you're not, you're not seeing the Bund in every local German American organization, the way any, every Russian organization is, is being, is common turn. Yes. And I, it's, it's totally true. Totally. I completely agree. So you've flagged here two organizations that, start filling the gap. One is civil society and the portrayal of Leon Lewis is really remarkable. I mean, I, you know, this is somebody who is completely lost to history and is actually an incredibly courageous uh, and capable character in running effectively a private intelligence operation. Um, but there's another actor that steps up in a way that I think is really interesting, and that is the much maligned House on Un American Activities Committee, yes. which you know <laughs> we think of in connection with Red Scares, particularly in the post-war environment. But they did some creditable work here, uh, exposing uh, German activity in Washington. So let's uh, having having. Uh, you know, recreated uh, as a historical character, Leon Lewis. Let's. Um, how much are you willing to do in uh, in um, uh, burnishing the reputation of the much maligned House on American Activities <laughs> Committee? Do I have a a Martin dies impression that I want to bring to that I want to bring to the table here? I, I mean, it is very interesting that you've got the Un American Activities Committee, which of course is nascent in the 1930s, and they do some, as you say, creditable work here. They do some very early work talking about how the Germans are propagandizing the U.S. public. Um, they do some later in the 30s, they do some work about these native fascist groups and violent plots that they are involved in that are potentially seditious. Um, you do get the sense when you look at the work of that committee and the, the work of those members of Congress in toto that they also are eyes left. They also believe that communism is the only real threat. They also have their own fascist sympathies in some cases, anti-Semitic inclinations, racist inclinations. Um, they, they, that's the way they're oriented. And so they'd prefer to be doing their work blowing up, you know, left-wing plots all over the country. But these damn fascists keep marching into the frame. <laughs> you keep getting, I mean, there, there's very large American native fascist groups that keep getting caught, like, I don't know, stockpiling bombs and planning mass assassination terrorist attacks against Congress and, you know, stealing U.S. military weapons and working with Nazi agents and traveling back and forth to Germany and clearly being funded by the Nazi party in Germany. Like the, the, what was what was happening was so big and in some cases so obvious in terms of its threat that it was begrudging, I think, on the part of the Un-American Activities Committee. But I will also say that once again, you get back to civil society, you get back to the ADL, you get back to the World Jewish Congress, you get back to other Jewish American groups that were forming their own intelligence operations um, to um, try to to try to defend Jewish communities in the United States. And they were producing actionable intelligence that the government had a hard time ignoring. And so some of the people who gave the most dramatic testimony at an American Activities Committee um, hearings in the 30s were people who had become spies, effectively, who had infiltrated these groups, either because they worked for newspapers that were 
funding them to do it, or because they worked for Jewish groups that the Jewish communities had organized themselves to try to protect themselves against these groups and expose what they were doing. And they sort of dragged the government along with them. It's interesting, though, that one of the striking features of the journalists that you talk about is that they are pretty uniformly not Jewish. Yes. And the 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 civil society activism is a whole bunch of Jewish groups and Jewish World War I, a Jewish World War One vet organizing German World War One vets, which you know warms my ecumenical heart. Yes. Um, <laughs> but the journalism is this weird motley collection of diggers, mm-hmm. and you know you have this uh, incredible account of the investigation by a a Minnesota journalist who is as white bread as they come of the silver shirt movement. And then there's this weird guy from Philadelphia who's in the sort of direct advertising uh, mail business. So what can we like, what can we say about the journalism here? Was this just people who caught a bug? Did they have something in in common uh, that made them want to hunt Nazis? What was what was the uh, what held to you know what do you learn about this group of people put together? I, this is my the, the, for me, this is the most just unqualified joyful part of this story because these people are all so interesting and because it is, I think, a real tribute to journalism just as a profession because they're all so different. So in Minnesota, the guy you're talking about, we go on to know as the famous CBS commentator Eric Severide. Before he was going by his middle name, Eric, he was going by Arnold Severide and he was a cub reporter. He was working in Minneapolis. He had heard that there was sort of a weird secret society in middle class and upper middle class homes in Minneapolis. And he decided to go undercover and infiltrate them and discovered this guy who was positing himself as the American Hitler, who had a weird pseudo occult, very anti-Semitic, very apocalyptic worldview, and had somehow persuaded thousands of people in Minneapolis alone and tens of thousands of people around the country to arm themselves, to form paramilitary cells and to join his organization. That was Eric Severide in Minneapolis. You had um, Dillard Stokes of the Washington Post, who was just kind of a badass city beat reporter, who had an editor who was interested in him chasing down some intrigue that seemed to derive from a grand jury investigation of the propaganda stuff um, that seemed to be happening involving members of Congress. Um, you had and you don't mention this in the book, but I think it's actually important that this is the period right after Eugene Meyer buys the old Washington Post, which is yeah. sort of a right wing newspaper and creates out of it the post that eventually becomes the the crusading uh, Watergate, Washington Post, right? The, this is the very beginning of that process The uh, in the first decade of the Graham family, Eugene Meyer owning that paper. Yeah. And this, the Dillard Stokes investigations, the Dillard Stokes reporting trail, which is so dramatic and so fascinating and which he got in so much trouble for on Capitol Hill. I mean, they were talking about, you know, not just subpoenaing him, but, you know, jailing Stokes jailing his editor, bringing the publisher in to, to to testify in Congress. I mean, the the pushback was incredible. But this was at a time when the, the Post was not influential. It was not the biggest paper in Washington. They were still on their way. And this aggression that they showed, it's interesting to think. You know, if Dillard Stokes had worked at a different paper, had that would that reporting have gone uh, the same direction that it did? Because he was fearless, and the blowback was incredible. You also had a guy like uh, John Metcalf, who worked for one of the um, one of the Chicago tabloids, who um, had grown up speaking German at home, and was, by his family's account, a total daredevil, just an absolute risk addict. 
And he jumped at the chance as a Chicago tabloid reporter to, you know, put on the brown shirt and the Nazi armband and go full undercover with all these Nazi groups um, and did some incredible reporting along with his brother, who was also involved in this stuff. There was also um, a guy named whose pen name was John Roy Carlson, whose name real name was Arthur Darunian, who was an Armenian American who went undercover. He wrote a book called Undercover. It was the best selling book in America in 1943, this incredibly dramatic story investigative tale about all of the native fascist groups and the links between them. So there's just all of these heroic journalists who all came from different backgrounds, uh, you know, ethnographically, came from different types of the journalism world, tabloid, serious broadsheet, um, investigative journalism, book length, magazine reporters. And the stuff that they turned up ended up opening the American people's eyes to this in a way that then called on our democratic his, our democratic traditions um, for the for the public to respond, but the the exposés that ran in all different kinds of uh, journalistic entities to me are still exciting, um, inspiring, and I feel like it's it's part of the part of the book that feels like a real instruction manual for what we ought to be doing today. Yeah, and and I also think the other uh, while we're talking about instruction manuals, the other part is a little discussion at the end of the lead of the electoral fallout that mm. we're, we're going to come back and talk about the villains here in a minute. Um, but there's a lot of members of Congress involved in, in, in the bad stuff. Um, and none of them goes to prison. None of them is convicted. None of them, uh, you know, if we're thinking about the criminal justice process, the uh, the process available to deal with this problem as a criminal matter was essentially zero. And yet they do lose and yeah. they, you know, they they are not people who they were very prominent in their day and they cease to be. And I I, I wonder if we are if electoral rebuke is a much more powerful weapon here than we sometimes think it is yes and it is the reward I mean, for, if you're looking at this in a terms of a utilitarian way it it shows the payoff for all the activism and all the journalism and everything else that everybody did in civil society to expose what they were doing um it, it, i think that one of the things, looking back at this as a historical um, uh, project, th th one of the things that's hardest to convey is that the people involved here who, in electoral politics were very famous and very influential. And it's hard to convey that because their names are not familiar now. And that is by virt that that is a, a product of the fact that they were voted out. People who get voted out of office, people who end up disgraced in office, end up often erased from history. I mean, there aren't that many Benedict Arnold figures in American history. Once you're a bad guy and you're rebuked for it and you lose because of it, you tend to disappear. There's a reason nobody remembers Spiro Agnew as, as, as Richard Nixon's vice president, for example. But if you can go back in history and see them has, as they were viewed in their time, it is striking how influential and what a big deal they were. I mean, Gerald Nye was seen as um, presidential timber for sure. He was an absolute institution in the United States Senate, um, but he was implicated in the Nazi plot in Congress. He, in fact, had during during the sedition trial, the defendants and their lawyers every week would meet in Gerald Nye's office to plot their strategy. This was all outed. This was all exposed in the press at the time. And he was voted out in 1944. Hamilton Fish, who's only remembered now because his name is hilarious, um, was one of the, was the sort of scion of one of the most famous American, famous and accomplished American political families. He had been in Congress for, for 24 years and was seen as totally unbeatable. But in 1944, after a campaign that focused almost entirely on his 
ties to this Nazi plot and this Nazi agent and the Nazi government, he was voted out. It was inconceivable that Hamilton Fish would ever lose that seat, but he lost that seat. Burton Wheeler, who was arguably Harry Truman's best friend in the Senate, who had enough weight to throw around that he got not one, but two prosecutors fired from the U.S. Justice Department for working on this story. Burton Wheeler uh, was himself voted out in 1946. Again, inconceivable that he'd be voted out because he was so powerful, so influential in such an institution. And those guys, um, and, and they aren't they aren't all of them. Most of the people who were implicated in this stuff in their time were voted out. There were only a very few, only a very few of them who survived it. And that electoral rebuke, as you put it, um, to me is instructive. It is worth remembering, and it is, I think, worth keeping in mind in terms of the the motivation, the purpose, the point of exposing this stuff. It you know the January sixth investigation in Congress doesn't result in prosecutions directly. You know, it doesn't put people in jail, but it does tell this story and it does make the truth known. It prevents revisionist history and it alerts the American people as to what their elected officials were up to. And that is important. All right. So one thing this outcome required in 1941 was the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, and a second thing that it required, which people forget about, is that five days after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the German Reich declared war on the United States, not the other yes. way around, yes. <laughs> um, yes. and thereby solved a problem that Roosevelt had been struggling with, which is how do you enter the war in Europe? And the answer is, well, the Europeans solve that problem for you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have no doubt that if Vladimir Putin tomorrow declared war on the United States and we found ourselves in a, a giant conventional war worldwide, uh, the universe of people who were engaged in this activity domestically over the last few years would be discredited rather quickly and you would have an electoral bloodletting. But I'm curious for your thoughts on what does all this exposure do in the absence of the ability, you know, in the absence of that cataclysmic event, you know, we expect there all this stuff about the America first committee was exposed and it chugged along just fine until, you know, December 7th. Uh, and that seems to me more or less consistent with the January 6th committee does its thing. The story is out there for anybody who wants to know. And 50% of Americans don't care. Uh, and electorally, we're not looking at a, you know, bloodbath for, for, you know, the Trumpist. Uh, um, so does it require a cataclysm and a sort of outside enemy uh, or is there some mechanism by which you, b by which this stuff would have amounted to the rebuke it did, even without that? Unknowable, I think. In 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 total, I think it's it's unknowable. But it's also it's kind of it's kind of the inherent truth of this, Ben. I mean, I feel like if the point here big picture is democracy defending itself against those who would undo democracy, either by violent military attack or by um, um, subverting democracy and, and turning us to a different form of government. Well, the way a democracy defends itself is by democratic means. And so there isn't a silver bullet. There isn't any one thing. There's no magic disqualification spell that you can cast over your enemies that makes everybody realize the same thing at the same time and that makes them disappear as the kind of enemy that you don't want to face anymore. I also feel like we have to be alert to the ways that these things work both domestically and internationally. You have to face them where they confront you. So, you know, if, if you, if, if, if it's fascism and other forms of authoritarianism that are militarist and expansionist and waging war around the world, then you 
beat them by beating them on the battlefield. And if it is anti-democratic movements at home that are trying to convince the American people that democracy is over and weak and no longer appropriate for our us, for us as a country, it's not the way that we should fix our problems anymore, then you, ha- the, you have to meet them on that battlefield too. And you need to make the case to the American people and that democracy is is the the way that we should govern our country and insist that our democracy meet the problems that we do have and show itself to be up to the task of the challenges that we face right now. And, you know, and if there's violent paramilitary groups operating on the on the on the on the bloody edges of our politics, they need to be prosecuted. They also need to be infiltrated and exposed and discredited. Like it just it just all has to happen. And I don't think there's an easier answer than that. I I do feel like there are some cautionary tales from previous uh, fights like this. I mean, one of the things that I find most chilling in this story from the 40s is the Justice Department caving to political pressure and removing prosecutors, not because of things they did wrong, but because they had stumbled into investigations that implicated powerful people. I think that's very, very dangerous. I mean... One of the things that is chilling to me is when President Truman himself um, caves to that kind of pressure and decides to submarine this information rather than expose it to the American public. And then it is hidden for for a decade and a half before anybody finds out um, what had been discovered by this Justice Department investigation. I mean, I I do feel like there's there's things that we did wrong. And to be clear, this was a Justice Department investigation that took place when the case had been mothballed, the prosecutor who uh, just happens to speak native German uh, picks up and goes across the ocean and starts interviewing senior Nazis who have not yet been executed um, and comes up with just a remarkable abundance of human and documentary source intelligence about the German side of these operations that he'd been prosecuting in this mothballed case. Is that a fair summary? Absolutely. Yeah. He was looking, one of the allegations in the Great Sedition Trial was that this was a conspiracy that involved all these Americans here with the German government. And it's one thing to allege that from here, looking across the ocean at the German government, but then once the war ends, to be able to go to Germany and document their side of that conspiracy to get corroborating information, both from Nazi war crime defendants and also from the German Foreign Office files. Just a remarkable thing to be able to do in a prosecutorial context. He did it under the understanding that the result of that investigation, even if the trial was not brought again, they were at a mistrial, so they had to decide whether to bring it back up. He, he did it with the understanding with the attorney general that he would be able to make a report to the public about his findings. When he brought his his findings back, the attorney general reneged on that. Um, And then the attorney general and and President Truman um, said that his report would never see the light of day. Now, it did. It took 15 years. In 1961, he was able to publish a version of it as a private citizen. But by then, the political sort of import of it, I think, was, was lost for decades, maybe until now. So before we turn to the villains of this story, I just want to ask about this urge in the mid-40s now. So the United States has been at war with Germany since 1941. These are discredited figures. Some of them still have positions, but these are not, as you say, uh, these are people whose, you know, uh, whose star has fallen at this point. And yet, uh, one of the defendants is in 1944, Sig Heiling on the steps of the courthouse. Yeah. Um, and apparently, you know, proudly and unashamedly, uh, they are, and the Justice Department, even after the war, is worried enough to deep six this report and to essentially drop the case. Um, And my question is, I I can kind of understand that in the 30s, but now we've just like invaded Germany, you know, we've decapitated this regime. Uh, the, the, The story of who this regime is 
is is now very well known. What is the reticence on the part of uh, Attorney General and future Supreme Court Justice Tom Clark and <laughs> and the sainted Harry Truman, who, by the way, is the president who recognizes the state of Israel, right? These are not like, you know, noted, uh, and he's the guy who ends the war by dropping the bomb, you know, like these are not faint hearted people in the anti-fascist department. And yet they're kind of quivering in fear of the public reaction to these spent domestic fascist forces. I'm curious why you think that happened. Was that just residual political power? It was because there were so many members of Congress and senators who were implicated. So the Justice Department charged congressional staffers for who had been involved with this Nazi agent in this big propaganda plot. They, they brought um, a few members of Congress in against their will um, to testify to the grand jury, but they never charged members of Congress or United States senators. They, I, I believe as a non-lawyer, looking at what they were looking at, looking at the people they did charge, I think there was absolutely a case to charge Hamilton Fish, absolutely a case to charge Senator Ernest Lundeen had he survived, although he died in 1940 in a plane crash. Um, there were the, the, the members of Congress who had their staffers charged. Um, they themselves could have been, I, I believe, could have been charged themselves, but they were never charged. And then in 1944, when the judge dies in the middle of this chaotic out of control sedition trial and the justice Which, by the department. way was the only rational response to what yeah. was going on in his courtroom <laughs> yes, exactly <laughs> yes. strong point judge Iker. strong point i can't argue with you there you went home 7 months into the trial and just died um but when the justice department had to decide whether or not to bring this this case again uh, you know the supreme court by then had had uh, decided a number of First Amendment cases that made even John Raggi, the prosecutor, believe that they had a worse chance than they had had at the outset um, of, of getting convictions. But the, 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 the submarining of Raggi's report and the firing of Raggi from the Justice Department and the unwillingness to make any of this known to the public was absolutely about it being too close to American power. And I think part of that may have been that people like Wheeler were throwing their weight around. You know, Wheeler was um, had the ear of the president. Um, Wheeler had already succeeded in getting one attorney general, Francis Biddle, to fire another prosecutor, John uh, William Power Maloney, on, on this same case. But the other part of it, by 1946, by the time Raggi got back from Germany, was, hey, listen, the story, I mean, Truman, I should be clear, Truman never explained himself. So I'm surmising this of my own, um, out, out of my own brain. But you know, the story there was that we were the good guys and the Nazis were the bad guys. And we, the good guys, went over there and won and dispatched them from the earth. And now we are going to take on our role as the sole superpower in the world and square off against the Soviet Union and make sure that the world is safe for democracy. And by the way, we need to rebuild Europe on the way. I mean, he was like, we have bigger fish to fry. The idea that we would then also need as a public to contend with two dozen members of Congress and the U.S. Senate, having been part of what they knew was a Nazi project inside the U.S. government, it just wasn't I think a narrative that he wanted to engage in, it wasn't a, a public, you know, expository project that he wanted to have to do. I, I don't, I, I can sympathize with the sort of impulse. We see it in lots of presidents, right, who don't want to deal with the, the deep, ugly consequences of the behavior of U.S. officials under previous administrations. But every time you let something like that slide, it just atrophies our muscles for being able to confront it when it rolls around again. Yeah. So let's, uh, with all of that as a giant prologue, let's turn to the plot itself, um, and um, which is where a normal person, I think, would have started this interview. But, <laughs> um, but uh, I like to start with democratic antibodies before we get to fascist disease. Um, <laughs> One of the interesting things about the book is the claim, which I really hadn't known, that this propaganda effort started essentially the moment Hitler came to power, uh, and that the sense of the United States as a uh, 
a propaganda battleground was quite organic to the Nazi regime. So let's start with the highest altitude uh, villain here, which is uh, Hitler himself, and probably in functional terms, more Goebbels, the propaganda ministry. What were they trying to achieve in the United States? What they were trying to achieve was um, really, I think, three things. Uh, one, the smallest of them, was to activate the German-American population, the German-American diaspora in the United States, which is large, um, to effectively side with Germany to become an important political force in the United States and trying to keep the United States from um, allying itself against German interests in the in the war. That was kind of, I think, their smallest project. Um, their sort of medium-sized project was to support and encourage and add fuel to what was the very widely held belief in the United States, which is that the United States should not enter the war. In the wake of World War I, the American public had zero appetite for getting involved in another European war. In 1940, uh, some, some public polling showed that as many as as much as 83% of the U.S. public did not want us to be involved in the in in what by then was very clearly World War II, uh, so they just wanted to add whatever they could to the isolationist side of the argument in domestic U.S. politics. But then I think their biggest project um, was to soften us up um, as a as a society and as a uh, as a democracy, to make the American public disbelieve what they derided as atrocity stories about Nazism and about Germans, to feel at least curious, if not positive, about fascism as a potential form of government, and to feel dissatisfied with democracy as our own system of government to make us feel like democracy was corrupt, that our own government shouldn't be trusted, that people like President Rosen, uh, Roosevelt, you know, or Rosenfelt, as they called him, yes, uh, were they, actually they changed secretly, the name. Yeah, secretly being controlled by, by the Jews or by other international forces and not being, uh, not acting in the interests of the American public. And that was to make us weak and divided, um, but also to potentially soften us up for either a, a takeover by an invading force or a takeover by native fascist forces that would ally the U.S. with Germany rather than against them. So they were operating at a number of different levels, and they were committed from the very first days of, of Hitler's government in, in Berlin um, to really spending whatever it took to propagandize the American public as aggressively as they propagandized any other public in the world. Yeah. So it seems to me from the book, they had basically three instruments with which they were doing that. One was uh, a, and they were integrated, of course, with one another, but one was they, a very respectable uh, campaign by uh, domestic civil society organizations like the America First Committee uh, that were led by genuinely American figures like, um, uh, you know, Senator Lundeen and, um, and Charles Lindbergh. Uh, the second is the seeding of uh, uh, fascist and uh, and sometimes thinkers and sometimes just violent terrorist organizations. Uh, and then the third was these random investments in weird grifters. Um, <laughs> you know, the sort of, uh, I have an idea, I want to be the Fuhrer, and the Germans, you know, catch wind of it and they kind of invite you to Berlin and, you know, maybe you're nobody. You're just kind of in it uh, like, but you've proclaimed yourself the next Fuhrer. And they seem to have a venture capital like approach to such people, which is kind of invest in all of them and see what happens. Um, and in. I, I mean, some of these people have drifted into obscurity like like. 
uh, George Sylvester Vierick. But some of them, like Father Coughlin, are kind of legendary names in particularly the history of anti-Semitism, you know, Henry Ford, of course. But um, and so I'm curious, was this a co coordinated strategy? They're like, all right, we're going to get our congressional people. We're going to get our, you know, our lunatic grifters. We're going to have some terrorists. Was th or was this just different parts of the German government throwing money at different elements of American society? It's a really good question. And it's one of the things that actually Raggi tried to untangle when he went over to Germany in 1946 and went through their records to figure out, you know, was this all emanating from the same part of the Nazi government? Was this um, was this a point of contention in the German government? Were there different elements? And it is, it's, you know, it was turns out it's a, as complex as it would be in any other large organization trying to do a big, complex, covert operation like this. But you're right that they were investing in all sorts of different levels. Like, for example, there's a guy um, who features heavily in the book whose name is George Detheridge, which is this you know, great name. Um, but he sort of embodies this. He gets brought over to Germany, to Erfurt, Germany, um, in the 30s to speak at what the Nazis were then organizing as an annual world conference of anti-Semites. Oh, well, great. That's a thing that we needed in the world. But he was the first, one of the, the first Americans to ever address a large Nazi gathering when he was invited, um, along with a number of other Americans, to address that gathering. He went home and founded something called the American Nationalist Confederation, which used as its emblem the Nazi swastika. And he tried, with support from Germany, from the German government, ongoing contact with the Nazis in Berlin, he tried to organize what would effectively be an umbrella organization of U.S. fascist groups to work together toward what they hoped would be a violent overthrow of the U.S. government. Um, they had uh, they had their new Führer picked out. It was going to be the the deputy chief of staff of the U.S. Army, um, George Van Horn Mosley. They um, had united all of these groups under the basic plan of how they were going to set off terroristic cell violence in the wake of what they expected to be an electoral disappointment that would upset isolationist minded Americans. They were in con Death Ridge was in regular consultation with the German embassy in Washington. Um, so it was, you know, he wasn't he wasn't a German. He wasn't um, somebody who was sent over from Germany to be a spy here. He was a native born American fascist, but working in close consultation with the Germans to bring about uh, the kind of change that they wanted to see, the kind of organizing they wanted to be able to build on in the United States. He's ultimately one of the sedition trial defendants who's, who's so let I, off. I want to like it, it seems to me that so he he was basically a nobody when mm -hmm. he goes over to the World Congress of Anti Semites. You might say he is roughly like oh say Carter Page, that is a <laughs> self described intellectual who is sympathetic to the authoritarian or in that case totalitarian foreign government and kind of wanders over and they welcome him and kind of invest in him. Um, and when we see somebody like Carter Page, you know, the, the, the defense of him is always, well, he was kind of a, an, like a weird fish and a nobody. Um, but of course, Putin does invite him to give these speeches uh, uh, and he's tr not treated that way uh, either by the Trump campaign or by the the Russians. And I, I was thinking about him when I was reading about George Deathridge, which is like, okay, you pronounce yourself a, theor a fascist theoretician who has grand ambitions and the fascists come find you. Shouldn't that make us wary when we see somebody – Oh, say Carter Page, you know, declare himself uh, a you know important conduit between Russia and the United States, and somebody who's going to explain Russian policy, and the Russians then invest in him. It seems to me you don't really know whether you're dealing with a George Deathridge or a Carter Page until you follow up on it. Yeah, and you don't know what's ultimately going to become of them, right? I mean. <laughs> 
the thing about sedition prosecutions, right, inherently is that if the if you're charged with trying to overthrow the government, the government has put you on trial for that, which means you didn't succeed in overthrowing the government, <laughs> which means that inherently you can argue your defense can be, oh, this wasn't serious. Oh, I'm just a goofball. Oh, I'm just a crackpot. Oh, I'm no. Oh, I'm nobody because it did. It didn't work. And for all of these guys, like there is there the, the, the decision you sort of have to come up against over and over again, as much in history as you do in our current day is stupid or dangerous? And the answer I have finally learned now that I'm 50 years old is the answer to stupid or dangerous is yes. It is not an either or situation. And you never know um, whether the George Detheridge figure or the Charles Coughlin figure or the um, William Dudley Pelly figure or any of the other people who were who you could dismiss as crackpots as you wanted to were ever going to ascend to a point where they could actually effectuate their plans or have real influence. I mean, who would have thought that Donald Trump would not only win the Republican nomination, but win the presidency? Like, it was very, very, very easy. It's even still today hard sometimes to take him seriously as a figure of global import. But yet, here we are. And I think the investment by hostile foreign powers in people who might seem ridiculous um, at the outset is is kind of a VC strategy is, you know, yeah, a bunch of these people will end up being cheap to us and of no account. But that also has its own benefit because then it can that we can use their clownishness to downplay the importance of our investment. And just to be clear, uh, neither of us are making any allegations about Mr. Page. Um, Not at all. Uh, um, so it seems to me three of the VC recipients, though, pay off in spades. Um, and uh, you do kind of looking at them in retrospect, say, okay, well, that was a, that was a win um, for, for the Nazis. One is uh, Virik, uh, who runs this incredible operation with these members of Congress. Another is Coughlin, who becomes the most, uh, one of the most important figures in U.S. media history, just in terms of his reach. Mm -hmm. And the third is uh, the Coughlin spinoff group, which, uh, which is the Christian Front, which is, seems to me important because it amasses a significant amount of weaponry. And just as an, as an old counterterrorism guy, one of the big differences between the people who were dangerous and the people who were not dangerous is explosives. Yes. Um, you know, it's just, it's a good rule. What, good rule of like, thumb. Do you have explosives? That's a, like a big binary check mark. So I, I want to, I want to ask you about each of them. Um, uh, Virik, the story of Virik and his relationship with a U.S. Senator who conveniently dies um, is it's a remarkable story, and it's a story that makes me wonder which of our current officials, you know, it raises the collusion question, right? Mm -hmm. When when somebody sounds like uh, the Nazi government, maybe it's because some the Nazi government is paying him to say those things. Uh, when somebody sounds like a spokesman for Vladimir Putin, it, you know, it just raises that question. And so uh, I just walk the, for those who have not yet read the book, walk us through what Virik was doing with more than 20 members of the House and Senate. So we'll take Senator Lundin, the senator who died in the plane crash, as the as the example here. So Lundin was... Um, definitely isolationist in his outlook. He had been against the U.S. joining uh, World War I. He, in fact, had lost his seat in the House because of that, but then had come back and become a senator and was a very, very strident isolationist voice against us being in, getting involved in World War II. He was also a real creep and corrupt. And one of the ways we know that is that when his Senate staff would be paid every week, he would demand from them cash kickbacks. So they would have to hand over to him a portion of their weekly salary um, in cash, and they wouldn't get a receipt. And that was part of what it meant to work for Ernest Lundin. He was just a 
he was a he was a scumbag. Um, uh, forgive me for saying it. So in those terms, I've been looking for a long time to find uh, other nice things to say about Senator Lundeen to give a more balanced um, <laughs> portrayal Some of him. Just I, bad. I have yet to find a lot of good things to say about Ernest Lundeen. Um, so Virick. Um, had been actually in contact with him for a long time, going back to his World War I isolationist days. Um, and in World War II, he hit upon this idea that um, Lundin, who seemed to be money motivated, um, could be persuaded not just to continue to advance his isolationist line, which Germany favored, but instead to get more specific about it and actually to put his name on things that were authored in Germany and by uh, by Virick as a German agent, um, if he could be paid for doing so. And so they entered into a mutually beneficial arrangement where Virick would bring to him German propaganda, Lundin would put his name on it, they would have it published in magazines or newspapers for money, and they, and they would split the funds. Or more often, Lundin would deliver it either as a speech or insert it into the congressional record. And then um, Virick would um, pay for there to be gazillions of copies of that made at a discounted government printing rate, and then it would be sent out under Lundin's congressional franc, so sent out without postage, with the taxpayers paying the postage um, all over the country. So it was both a money-making scheme and also essentially a free mouthpiece, free speech-writing scheme for Lundin. It was very efficient, very satisfying to the German Foreign Office, we know from German records. And when Lundin um, uh, was such a success, Virick then expanded from Lundin to lots of other members of Congress. Hamilton Fish was the worst in, in the House. And they ran what ultimately was a multi-million dollar effort, which sent out millions of pieces of German authored propaganda at government cost, at taxpayer expense to American homes. So what about Coughlin? It seems to me he's a figure with perhaps the most the most uh, uh, immediate contemporary analog? Coughlin is, uh, for me, um, I, I feel like he's like the, the way I calibrate my scale in terms of thinking about whether there are modern doppelgangers for these historical figures. Like, clearly we have a um, very influential um, very right-wing media apparatus that has a really important role to play in reactionary politics in this country today. We have no Charles Coughlin <laughs> today. Like there's, he's got 30 million weekly listeners by some counts by the late 1930s at a time when there are way fewer than 200 million people living in the country. I mean, he's got basically a quarter of the country listening to him at some times. While he is saying I take the road of fascism while he is saying we need to follow the Franco way, what he calls the Franco way in this country, meaning we need a military dictatorship, while he is organizing his followers into armed paramilitary cells to pursue a fascist takeover of the U.S. government. I mean, to have that wide a reach and that radical a message is something that I think there are pretenders to that throne today. And there are pretenders to that throne in your and my lifetimes in terms of watching watching the right. But he was he was of an order of magnitude difference in terms different in terms of his his reach and influence and his radicalism and therefore his dangerousness. So I'm going to ask you two more questions and then let you go. Okay. The first is one thing that is doppelgangery about this period when you read about it in your book versus versus now is just how corrupt everybody is that everybody from the America First Committee which is burning trash in in you know burning its records in trash barrels to the senator who's taking kickbacks from his staff to you know Pelly who's you know just going from one publishing grift to another Everybody. To Coglin too, who's Co becoming Co immensely and personally rich, rich real as, a, as a serving Catholic priest, right? right? I mean, he's he's a he's a gazillionaire by the time the Catholic Church finally shuts down his radio show. Is there something inherent about the relationship between populist authoritarianism and simple grifting corruption? Yes. 
<laughs> there I think is. there is. <laughs> there is. And and it is logical, right? I mean, if if you are if you want to in a democratic system of government um, with a free press and an independent judiciary, people who grift, you know, people who who commit fraud, people who use their public office for corrupt purposes are exposed and prosecuted. And even if they're not prosecuted, they're held to account by an informed democratic polity that has the opportunity to reject them at the polls if they are shown to be um, criminally inclined or morally suspect. That's no good (laughs) if what you're after is the ability to commit crimes and steal with impunity. It would be much better if that's your inclination in public life um, to be in a strongman form of government where it matters who you are and whose side you're on and you get to take what you want with impunity. I mean, that's there is there's I I think I I have learned a lot on, on this front from Alexei Navalny and his organization in Russia in terms of the way they have centered corruption in their analysis of what happened to Russia's proto-democracy and what Russia's Russians day-to-day suffering is in living under a dictatorship like Putin's. It is, you know, corruption is 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 hand in glove with authoritarian government, with strongman government, and as as it has always been. And I think there's real, there's a, there's a profound truth to that. One of the very upsetting things about the book, and I want to leave this here, is that some of the good guys die in total obscurity and some of the bad guys, including Father Coughlin, you know, who gets shut up by his diocese in 1942, but who has a million in real estate and and dies a very rich man in 1979, having been never been stripped of his priesthood. I mean, this is a, uh, you know, a bunch of these people who are the bad guys go on to uh, essentially unrepentant uh, lives. Um, and, you know, you note about the Washington Post reporter whose name is escaping me that when Dillard he died, Stokes. Dillard, Dillard Stokes, Stokes. Yeah. that when he died, he got a very modest obituary and you say sort of plaintively, he deserved better. Um, what should we make of the fact that, you know, there is no justice here, just in the karmic sense of what happens to Leon Lewis and, Lu- and Dillard Stokes and O. John Raji, who's, you know, the head of the criminal division and at the beginning of the book and dies in obscurity at the end of the book. Hmm. And that, you know, we have a famous fascist architect and a very rich father Coughlin and a 95 year old terrorist who's giving unrepented joins the bar in Brooklyn finally at 90 or whatever. What, what do we make of the cosmic karmic injustices here? Yeah. And, and I would add to this that George Dethridge goes on to be kind of a thing in Republican politics. And some of the um, some of the William Langer is another senator who plays a sort of devious role in all of this. And he ends up um, playing a, a disgusting role in this um, effort to try to send black Americans to Africa against their will. I mean, these guys go on. He's one of the people that isn't voted out. There is a um, there is a level of cosmic injustice in this story that um, I feel like I'm working on. I am trying to make Henry Hoke famous, the ad man who who exposed the propaganda plot in in Congress out of his own private sector investigations. I'm trying to make John Rogge. Uh, hero in the U.S. Justice Department, and not somebody who got fired for getting cross purposes with an attorney general who went on to the Supreme Court. I'm trying to make that episode in Harry Truman's presidency, where he decided to submarine this, something that is seen as a black mark on his presidency and not something that is forgotten. I'm trying to uh, make Leon Lewis as famous as I can possibly make him. He died not long after this episode running this spy ring, he died in a car crash on the Pacific Coast Highway and his obituary mentioned none of this heroism. I want these heroes, Dillard Stokes and 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 all the rest of them. I want I want this heroism to be known. And even if it wasn't known in their lifetime, I want us to learn from it. 
I feel like they did something that was a huge contribution in their time. It is also a huge contribution in our time, as long as we're willing to learn it. I also, you know, listen, I work in the news business. I spend a lot of time every day thinking about working on, reporting on, and explaining the doings of the worst people in America and the worst people in the world. It is also worth not letting those people be lost to history and hold, holding them to account too. The long tale of Philip Johnson, the long tale of Charles Coughlin, the long tale of George Dethridge is a tale that should have been stepped on by a public that was better informed about their villainy. And I am invested in that too, and I'm invested in that for today's uh, doppelgangers for those bad guys. We are going to leave it there. It's a great place to end. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today. Ben, this was so fun. Thank you for the close read of the book and all your thoughts on it. This is a really stimulating conversation for me. I really appreciate it.